last night. Thank you for doing that. Um, quick check, by the way. What, was there an earthquake at 4.50 today? <laughs> I thought maybe it was a localized event in my bedroom, which is fine, but I just didn't know. I didn't, I, there was an earthquake, right? Okay, okay. <laughs> good. All right, before we start, first of all, uh, can, can you all just give a huge bloody round of applause to Tony and Tara? What an amazing day yesterday. Seriously. Thank you, wherever you may be. What a great day. Um, like you, I've done a number of things in my life. I've, I've, been, a, I've been a writer, I uh, was an entrepreneur, uh, sort of am an entrepreneur, built a coaching and, and software company. Some of my team are, are right here. Um, but I'm actually here not in those capacities. I'm here as a researcher. That's really what I'm here to talk about and share. Because as some of you know, I spent the first uh, 17 or so years of my career at Gallup trying to measure things that are really hard to measure. So measure performance, how do you do that? As Tara said, almost all work these days is knowledge work. How do you measure that? How do you measure engagement? How do you measure, how do you measure strengths? How do you measure personality? So I spent 17 years doing that and the last year joined the ADP Research Institute to continue to investigate in a database, as Tara says, a database driven way, what is the world of work like? How do, in both meanings of this phrase, how do people work? That's what I'm super interested in, so that's what I imagine many of you are interested in, and that's what I want to share this morning. The basic approach that I take, I don't know what you take, but the basic approach that I take is what I would call a free thinking approach to research, which means if you want to understand or study something, you look at it as it really is. If you want to understand what great leaders look like, you don't come in with preconceptions, you don't come in with theory, you don't come in with dogma, you just look at the thing as it really is. What do good leaders look like? If you want to understand what good leaders are, you should study good leaders. If you want to understand what good teachers are, you should study, without a pre-existing set of ideas, what good teachers really look like. That's what you should, that's what you should do, which, as I say it, it just sounds like a crashing glimpse of the obvious. Of course you would do that. And yet, and yet you look at what we actually do, and we actually take the opposite approach. We seem to believe that good is just the opposite of bad, and if you want to get good, you should just study bad and invert it. So in order to learn about health, we study disease. To learn about joy and meaning and wisdom in life, we study depression. In order to learn how to keep our employees super engaged, we do exit interviews and study the ones that leave. <laughs> Everywhere you look, we seem to believe that good is just the opposite of bad. If you want good, you should study bad and invert it. No, if you study bad and invert it, you get not bad. And, and that's just different than good or great, isn't it? We can take a bunch of examples from the world of work, but let's not. Let's take an example from your personal lives. Let's take marriage. <laughs> growing, Let's take Most marriage therapy is based on the idea that a good marriage is the opposite of a bad marriage. If you want a good marriage, study the really rotten marriages and then say, don't do that. And when you study the rotten marriages, although it turns out that every marriage is unhappy in its own way, if you... <laughs> I said that by mistake one time and <laughs> nobody laughed except me. I thought that was funny. <laughs> if you study the really rotten marriages, although every unhappy marriage is unhappy in its own way, if you study all the really unhappy marriages and relationships, it does turn out that they do have one thing in common. You didn't know you were going to learn this today, but they have one thing in common. In all the really unhappy marriages, people argue a lot. I know. I was shocked too. But it's, it's, but it's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. In all the really rotten marriages, people argue a lot. So, following the logic that good is just the opposite of bad, if you want a really good marriage or relationship, you should do the opposite of this. So, in a really good marriage or relationship, don't fight. And yet, when you actually study the really good relationships, you really study them, and you count the fights. You ask the, you know, the researchers uh, there in their offices, and someone's like pinging them. Whenever you're fighting, count it, write it down, and you count the fights. It turns out there is no statistically significant difference between the number of fights in a really good marriage and the number of fights in a rotten marriage. It turns out that the difference between a great relationship and a rotten one isn't the number of fights. It turns out that the difference is what happens in the space between the fights. 
And in a rotten relationship, it turns out that you become more and more unsafe, more vulnerable in the space between the fights. And you re reach back and, and back and physically and psychologically until one day you wake up and you're separated. And in the really good relationship, somehow you use the space between the fights. And fights are okay, but in the space between the fights, you use it because you feel safe. You use it to reach toward one another, to reach toward one another. So the fights are actually a way for you to reconnect. Now, I don't know what it is that draws two people back together in the space between the fights. That's a different presentation for much, much later in the evening. But whatever it is that draws two people out together, my point is you learn nothing about this from studying rotten relationships. Here's the thing, folks. Excellence isn't the opposite of failure. As the president said yesterday, yes, we can study what's wrong, but I don't know whether you heard this. He almost immediately said, but you know what else we do? We do after-action reviews to study what works. Excellence has its own pattern. You can't infer what excellence looks like from studying failure. If you want to learn a lot about failure, study failure. If you want to learn a lot about disease, study disease. If you want to learn a lot about depression, study depression. Just don't imagine it will tell you anything about joy. It won't. Excellence has its own pattern. All of us in this room, as Tara said, so much change is going on, but all of you in this room have to be, along with me, students of excellence. Because only by studying excellence will you actually understand what its configurations are. Now, if you take, if you take a free-thinking student of excellence approach to the world of work, you discover that an awful lot of things that we believe to be true just aren't. And as, and I know it looks like sort of Albert Einstein here, but as Mark Twain said, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Well, there's an awful lot of stuff about the world of talent that we know for sure that just ain't so. We first took this and we applied this, myself and my colleague, Ashley Goodall, who runs talent for a really big chunk of Cisco. Do we have any Cisco folks in the house? There we go. All right. So Cisco, 70,000 people and 70,000 more contractors. I mean, hardware, software, global. It's kind of the future of talent. So I wanted to work with Ashley on what is the, like you as a practitioner, in the world of talent. So we turned to HBR and they said, could you take this free thinking, research-based approach, this, this student of excellent approach to performance reviews? Because we know those are going really well. And, and almost all performance reviews are based upon the idea that we know for sure that if we give people enough training and we give people the right technology, they become, if they really work with using that technology, they can become the most reliable raters of other people's performance and potential. How many of you, raise your hands if you work in a, any kind of company where you've ever been rated in your performance review? Who's got a rating? Ever got a rating? Most of you have. Right? One of those ratings where if you're really good, you're a five. If you're less good, you're a four. Unless your company's run out of fours, in which case you're a three. Right? What, what is that? We don't have any, sorry, we don't have any fours left. Run out of fours. Next year, we'll probably have a few more. This year, you're a three. Love you, but you're a three. So, so, so right? So we took this. And we applied it to the performance review because what we know for sure is that, gosh, people can be reliable raters of other people. But actually, it turns out that that just ain't true. It turns out when I rate you on something, performance or potential, most of the ratings that I rate you on, hi, by the way, <laughs> hi, waving, still awake, which is great. Um, when I rate you on anything, performance, potential, strategic thinking, most of the variation in my rating is a function of me, not you. Which is a problem because we pay you, promote you, and train you, develop you, as though my rating of you reflects you, and it doesn't. It reflects, it reflects me, which is annoying for most of us in this area. So we've tried to remove this by creating ever more detailed performance reviews and so on. And it turns out the more complicated we make the rating scales, the more behaviorally anchored they are. And I know this is one of those things that some of you know for sure, but it just ain't true. The more detailed we make them, the bigger this rating effect becomes. We now know that when I rate you on something, 61 to 62% of the variance of my rating of you is a function of me, not of you. And it works like this. When I rate you on something, let's say it's five, I don't know, attributes or something, each with a behavioral anchor or two in there, there's a pattern to my ratings. I skew here, and then you're low here, and you're high here. When I then look at you, the pattern should change because I'm looking at a different human being. And then when I look at you, the pattern should change again because you're a different human being. This rating system is presumably a window that allows me to see you. Here's the thing, folks. It doesn't change. My pattern of rating moves with me 
We can see it. Tara was saying, let's be data fluent in the world of talent. My pattern moves with me. It's called an idiosyncratic rater effect. I have an idiosyncratic pattern to my ratings. I might be a, a really broad rater that uses the entire scale. I might be a super little tight rater in the middle. I might be skewed way to the right and just be really generous. Or I might be a super tough rater and skewed to the left. I don't know. And this isn't a function of my race or my gender or my age. I'm not talking about unconscious rater bias in terms of race and gender and age. I'm talking about an idiosyncratic pattern of ratings that I'm singularly unaware about. And yet it moves with me. Which means that 61 to 62% of my rating of you and you and you reflects me, not you and you and you. Now some will say, oh that's okay. Well just, I know your data's bad, but we'll add it to more people. We'll, 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 we'll take six other raters, we'll do a 360. Because although your data is bad, when we add more bad data to more bad data, at some point it magically turns into good data. Wow, there it is. No, no, no. No, if, for those of you that know data, if there is a systematic error to the data, it doesn't turn into good data after you've added a bunch together. It's like if your thermometer is broken, and yours is broken, and yours is broken, adding a bunch of broken thermometers readings together doesn't turn it into the right temperature. It's broken. So here we go, a problem where we, now look, three years ago no one cared. Because you took these 360 data, or you took your ratings data, and you put it in a drawer, and you forgot about it. Today, we live in a, as Tara is saying, we live in a database world where we put all this data into a human capital management system, and it lives with you forever. So we wrote this piece for HBR, basically saying, uh, all our data is bad. All our data is systematically bad about a something called what should we call it? Uh, performance. It's all bad, and it's not irrelevant. Your ratings on the stuff that I give you, or maybe that we've aggregated across your peers and your direct reports, turns into stuff that will affect the way you get paid, trained, developed, maybe the way you get terminated. All sorts of things that actually mediate your world of work comes from something that is flawed. Okay, that's a huge problem for us. So we wrote this piece, and then it became, I guess it just got a ton of traction. It became the most downloaded piece uh, in 2016. And, and I guess, uh, according to Burson by Deloitte, 83, 84% of companies, I don't know whether it's a function of this, but are now trying to redo their entire approach to performance. Because as Tara said, if we're going to move into a database world, we better know the difference, not between you know, big data and small data, but the difference between good data and bad data. We've got to know that. So they came back, HBR came back to us after this and went, uh, could you... Could you take that free-thinking, student of excellence approach and apply it to the entire world of work? Culture, learning, leadership. Could you take it and apply it to as much as you could see? And when you do that, folks, you find that, going back to Twain, an awful lot of what we know for sure just ain't so. Now, I don't know what you would find. If you took this approach, I don't know what you would find. We found a number of, what would you call them? Misconceptions? misunderstandings, myths. We didn't call them those because they're pushed at you really hard, almost as though someone has an agenda. We called them lies. <laughs> it's hard, for those of you that run teams, it's hard to run a team. As Tara described, there's all sort of stuff that's coming down the pike that's gonna force you to change. It's really hard to stay on top of talent, both here domestically in the US and around the world. We gotta try and stay on top of it. Boy, it's just really hard when you're being fed a bunch of lies about the way that people really work. How many lies in a pack? Well, nine, as it happens. <laughs> here and I. Look, you may find others. You may find others. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you these nine lies. Now, I warn you, a number of these lies, you're going to just be sure are so. I, I promise you, I'm going to put them up, and there's going to be some of you that are like, that's, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> so I warn you. But here are the nine. You ready? Nine lies about work. A free thinking leader's guide to the real world. Here's the first one. People care which company they work for. Uh, no, no, they don't. They care which company they join. They don't really care which company they work for. How about this one? The best plan wins. Uh, no, it doesn't. 
Planning is great, helps you survive, doesn't help you win. What helps you win? How about this one? The best companies cascade goals. Uh, no, they don't. No, they cascade other things, but not necessarily goals. Oh, but goals will create alignment. No, it won't. No, no, it won't. The best companies don't cascade goals, actually. They cascade other things. What about this one? Well-rounded, oop, let me go back. Well-rounded people are better. Or this one, people crave feedback. Uh, no, they don't. <laughs> and if you don't believe that, just get married. <laughs> These are just jokes. They're just jokes, people. <laughs> this one. This was the one that Ashley and I wrote the HBR piece on. This one. People can reliably rate other people. Notwithstanding the ice skating competitions at the Winter Olympics. But, but they can. <laughs> they can. Okay, this one. This is going to annoy some of you. I know it's going to annoy you. But, ah, but, but it's, uh, it's not true. Uh, people have potential. Um, I know this is like a talent development. <laughs> but like, there's a thing called potential. It's in you. You have a certain amount of it. You move it from situation to situation. If you have a lot of it, we call you a hypo. If you have less of it, we call you a nopo. Well, I know, I know which one I'd rather be. There's another one here. We should seek work-life balance. Yes, best of luck on that. Apparently, you're supposed to keep it all perfectly spinning and juggling, perfectly balanced. And boy, when you do, you, don't, you just want to go, nobody move. Nobody move. I've got it all perfect. Just, shh, shh, nobody, nobody move. Move. Here's another one. Leadership. That's a thing. Leadership is a thing. You have it. And if you don't have enough of it, well, go get you more of it. Now, I know some of us are in a little leader development business. So you're like, wait, wait, of course leadership is a thing. I've seen, we saw it yesterday on stage. No, you saw a leader on stage. But leadership as a thing, ooh, ah, best of luck defining that. Best of luck measuring that. Okay, so you put them all together. Here's what you got. You got nine. I don't know if you can read those. Nine lies about work. Nine things we know for sure that just ain't so. We actually finished writing this book yesterday based upon what I saw from President Obama. Like, okay, <laughs> write that down. Because that's the last, the last chapter. And then annoyingly, HBR said, oh yeah, but the book takes about nine months to make. And, I, and I'm like, okay, I didn't write this to write a book. As Tara said, it's my ninth book. You look at these. These are all about how we get the most out of talent. Talent is any recurring pattern of thought or feeling or behavior, and all of us in this room are committed to helping build organizations or programs or experiences which help a person to manifest their talent. And a lot of this stuff takes us the wrong way. But the reason why I wanted to work with Ashley on this is because I want to get into the real world. We are trying to make change happen in the world. Work is a magnificent place in which a person gets to manifest their talent, but we can't do it if we are guided by the wrong assumptions, the wrong beliefs. So I went to HBR and I'm like, look, I can't wait nine months. I need to engage with you all right now. Like you, I'm super impatient. There's work to be done. There's change happening. There's work to be done. So they came back to us and they said, what happens if we built a coalition of free thinking leaders? And we supported it on HBR.com. And then, and then each month, for the next nine months, we could take one, two, three. We could go through each one of these things we know for sure that just ain't so. And then as a group of practitioners in the world of talent, we could dive into it and actually get into the reality of how we make change. Let's call that, says HBR, a coalition of free-thinking leaders. And, and I said, yes, let's do that. Let's do that. So for those of you, like me, that are impatient for change, for actually doing things in the real world that help people to manifest their talent, then please go to marcusbuckingham.com and it will show you how you can join this coalition of free-thinking leaders. Because I, I don't know what Ashley's point of view was. Mine was, I'm not writing a book to write a book. I want to engage with people like you to actually make change happen in the real world. And, 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 and we can do that. We can do that. Company by company, experience by experience. Some of you in this room are further ahead than others, but let's dive in together. Me and you, for the next nine months, let's peel each one of these apart and dive into what can we do to make work different and better and more effective. Yes? Okay. Now, what do we do today?
What do we do right now? I could go through every one of these, but we don't have that time and perhaps you don't have the attention, so I thought I'd pick one. I thought I'd pick one. And I didn't know, like, you can look at these like a Jeopardy board. Like, which one do you want to pick? I want to talk about balance. Oh my gosh, I want to talk about feedback. We know those millennials, they love that feedback. Um, leadership. Leadership's got to be a thing. Come on. Leadership's a thing. I can, I, can, I can define it and I want people to get better at it. Okay, but I, maybe. I, we could talk about any one of them. I thought I would focus on one that was really all about you and your talent, if that's all right. Because as Tara just said, you've got to put your own oxygen mask on first. So let's look at this one. Number four. Well-rounded people, they're just better. How do we know that we believe this? Is this a fake lie? Do we really believe this? Well, actually, we've been asking a question of 18 countries around the world for the last 25 years. Here's the question. Some of you know it. Your child comes home with the following grades. English A, Social Studies A, Biology C, Algebra F. We asked it that way in English-speaking countries. If every other country, we use their home language, obviously, as the first question. English A, Social Studies A, Biology C, Algebra F. And the question was this, which grade deserves the most attention from you? Now, we didn't say if you pick one grade, you must ignore all the others. Which grade just deserves the most attention from you? There isn't a single country where less than 70% say the F. There hasn't been a single year where less than 70% say the F. We begin really early saying the best child is a well-rounded child. The best student is a well-rounded student. You graduate into the world of work. You have two minutes on what you did well last year and 58 minutes on your areas of opportunity. Because the best employee is a well-rounded employee. Everywhere you look, we seem to have institutionalized this idea that the best people in every sphere or age of life is well-rounded. And yeah, if you take a free-thinking student of excellence approach and you just look at excellence in the real world, it doesn't look well-rounded, does it? Take the world of business. You could take, you could take um, Warren Buffett and Richard Branson. Totally different people. They're the same gender. They're the same race. They're roughly the same age. But you'd never say, Richard, Trumpy, Warlike, Warren. You'd just go, no, 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 they're unique. Or take the world of, of performing arts. You take Beyonce and Adele. Both beautiful, beautiful singers. But if you wanted to help Beyonce get better... Wait, she can't get any better. Okay, so if you wanted to help... <laughs> If you, if you wanted to help Adele get better, you wouldn't say be more like Beyonce. It would just be daft, wouldn't it? But I won't take the world of business, and I won't take the world of performing arts. Let's take sport, because why not? And I'm going to take a sport that's super popular around the world, that if you're raised outside of the US, you call football. We call it football. And the reason we call it football is because you play it with a foot. <laughs> here, over here, we call it soccer. I don't know, because you, you're wearing a sock. I don't, I don't know. OK, football. So listen, football, global, global sport, right? Now, if you think about who's the best player right now, for those of you that don't know, I mean, there's some great players over the years. Pele, Zinedine Zidane, Ronaldo. But we are blessed right now to have the Michael Jordan of soccer players. There is a player in the world right now who's not only the best player in the world right now, but is arguably the best ever. What's his name? Messi. Messi. Lionel Messi. I'm an Arsenal supporter. I <laughs> know. We're cheering. We shouldn't. We're struggling. We've played Barcelona a bunch of times in the Champions League. He always beats us. Some of you might have seen the El Clasico over the weekend. The goal that he scored, dead, 10 men down against Real Madrid. Absurd. Go, if you haven't seen it, be a student of excellence. We're in the talent business. Be a student of excellence. Go Google Lionel Messi's goals, and you'll find thousands of them. I picked one that is arguably the epitome of his goal-scoring prowess. In fact, it was such a, an example that ESPN devoted, devoted an entire sports science episode to this one goal. It's a goal that he scored against Atletico Bilbao in the Copa del Rey in, 19, in 2015. And it's extraordinary. I'm going to play it for you. It lasts 11.6 seconds, so watch really closely. 11.6 seconds. He goes from zero to 20 miles an hour in 1.6 seconds. The ball never goes more than a foot and a half from his, from his foot. And he does some things that are extraordinary. So I'm going to show it to you. It's the 2015 Copa del Rey. When you see it, Lionel is the one down at the bottom. He receives the ball. He passes it back to the right back. 
and then you'll see him, he gets the ball and he just stands there for a second, almost just wondering, I wonder what I should do now. And then you'll see what he does now. But seriously, watch, he gets it, pauses, thinks, hmm, and then does something. Okay, this is Lionel Messi playing for Barcelona against Atletico Bilbao in the 2015 Copa del Rey. You ready? Here we go. Right. Now, if you were to design a soccer player, you'd design a perfectly well-rounded player. I mean, look, look at him. But you, you design a perfectly well-rounded player like Ronaldo, who can score with his left, he can score with his right, score with his chest, score with his head. That's what you design. That's not what you got here. This man, Lionel, he was, he was born in Rosario in Argentina, a poor town. And, and he was really good, really young. I mean, if you want to go see sort of fun stuff, go type young Lionel Messi. You see a little chap here. Everyone else really tall. The ball looks like it's way too big, but it also looks like it's attached to his foot because seemingly he could do anything with it. And the scouts of Barcelona, some of you know this, so I'm sorry if you already do, but they came over at 13, they found him and they went, you're coming with us. They scouted him out at 13 and they took him to something called La Masia, which is the farmhouse, which is basically the talent development program for Barcelona. And they worked with him and they worked with him and they worked with him and they, and they tried to get him to get his right foot better, come and round yourself out, round yourself out. And they fed him growth hormones because he was little. And they kept feeding him growth hormone speed. And then at 15, they went, oh, forget it. You're Lionel. That's who you are. He topped out at 5'7". Well, they say he's 5'7". He's actually 5'6 and a half. He's a little guy. He's 5'6 and a half. And they said to him at 15, they just said, look, we're just going to give you two pieces of advice, Lionel. Number one, be dangerous. Be dangerous. Wherever you are, be dangerous. Which is something that we can all think about when we're helping our talent develop. Get into the outcomes business. They got into the outcomes business really fast and they went, Lionel, be dangerous. Wherever you are, you're on the, on the halfway line, I don't know, be dangerous. I mean, you could pass it back to the right back if you want, but then get it back and then think and then go be dangerous. So it's an interesting thing for us in the talent development business. They went, let's think about an outcome that can get this guy to, to really focus. Be dangerous wherever you are, Lionel. And the second thing they said is, could you really super develop your, right, your, your left foot? Super develop your left foot. Just keep focusing on it and focusing on it and focusing on it until it's so powerful and so fast and so precise. I don't know whether you saw it when you watched, but the precision of what he did, he went zero to 19 miles an hour in 1.6 seconds and then stopped on a dime and the ball stopped with him. How, how does that happen? But it's so fast, it can even though, and by the way, when I share this with you about the whole left foot thing, this is not news. It's not like you have to go, shh, don't anyone tweet this. Because everybody who follows soccer knows Lionel has a left foot. You know who else knows? All of the defenders who were playing for Atletico Bilbao. They all knew he only has a left foot, which is why they, if you saw this, right, he's, they were trying to usher him into the corner. They all knew he's only got a left foot, but it's so good, it's so powerful, it's so fast, it's so precise that it can bamboozle anyone, even though they know that's exactly what he's trying to do. They said, no, now for you the same is true, well, what's your left foot? Where's your left foot? What's your left foot? Because all of you can, we know everyone can grow, we know everyone can get better, we know that your brain is plastic and it retains its plasticity throughout your life. We know that. We know everyone in this room is in a state of becoming. You're a work in progress. We know that. But every one of you has a unique pattern to your brain. Learning is a function of neurogenesis. And we know that your brain creates new neurons and new connections between them, not randomly. We know this now. We know that you will grow more synaptic connections in those parts of your brain where you have the most pre-existing synaptic connections. Neuroscientists say learning is like new buds on an existing branch, not new branches. You learn and grow and develop the most in the areas where you've already got a left foot. You, not to say that you can't get better at the areas where you have a right foot. You can get a little better. But you learn and grow and develop the most in the areas where you've already shown some comparative advantage. And, and who wouldn't believe that? Why wouldn't we want to work in a team where somebody went, ah, oh, look at that beautiful thing you have. Can you help the rest of your team by bringing that? Who wouldn't want that? And yet, weirdly, if you ask people that question around the world and you go, hey, which do you think you want to focus on if you want to increase your performance and contribution? 
leveraging your strengths or fixing your weaknesses? Which should you do? In the US, 41% of people say strengths. In, in Canada and the UK, 38% say strengths. In, in France, 35% say strengths. In, in, in Japan, 24% say strengths. So there's some difference between, say, Japan and the US, some difference, but there isn't a single country in the world where more than 50% of people, when presented with that choice, right foot or left foot, in a sense, strengths or weaknesses, there isn't a single country where most people go strengths. Why is that? I mean, you may have your own opinions, and we could probably dive into what those opinions are, but, but I think an awful lot of it has to do with fear. We are more fearful of our weaknesses than we are honoring of our strengths when it comes to talent. And, and, and the fear sounds like this. Um, can I ask, I can't see, can I ask your name? Yes. Summer. Summer, can I use you as an example here? Did you bring the juggling balls? <laughs> prepare, prepare. Okay, so Summer. So I hire Summer. I'm, I'm your team leader, Summer. I bring you on board and I discover, like we all do whenever we hire anybody, I discover that you have some strengths and you have some weaknesses. You have a left foot, if you like, and you have some right foot. Good, Marcus. Uh, right feet. And then I bring you on board, I discover that let's say that you're really good with data, you're really organized, you're really structured, but you're not so good working with people. You show up for every meeting on time, it's just everyone wishes you weren't there. <laughs> right? Sorry, some of it. <laughs> Anyone else want to give Summer some feedback? Because she's <laughs> craving it. It's a big room. <laughs> okay, so listen. I'm really busy, I'm a team leader, I'm really busy. I'm well intended, but I'm really busy. I go, uh, okay, uh, you're really good with organization and structure and data, but you're not really good with people. I am frightened about that, because your, your weakness might hurt your colleagues. Your weakness might rub your customers, internal or external, the wrong way. Uh, your weakness might hurt you, and I actually care about you, and it might hurt your career. It might hurt me. My reputation's tied with you because I hired you. So for all those reasons, I go, Strengths, yeah, whatever. Fix this. F whatever. Fix it. Not because I'm a bad person, because I'm a good person. 